Good evening and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. With each passing day, cases of COVID-19 surge as the highly contagious virus rapidly sweeps the nation's big cities. Now, so far, many small towns and remote areas have been spared, but medical experts warn rural communities will not be shielded forever. And it's only a matter of time. Now, we know that you have questions about COVID-19 that are unique to rural America. So tonight, we're going to open up our phone lines and give you a chance to hear from the doctors who have been at the forefront of the crisis. 877-731-6733 is the number to call and join the conversation. We'd love to hear your questions or let us know how COVID-19 has changed your rural lifestyle. Again, that number, 877-731-6733. Joining us tonight, University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor and world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold and Chief Executive of Nemaha County Hospital in Nebraska. We have Marty Fadig joining us tonight as well. We know how important your time is right now, gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here for us tonight. We really appreciate it. Now, well, thanks so much, Christine. It's a great pleasure to join you. Oh, you know, we have so much ground to cover because we're learning so much about this virus every single day and how it could potentially impact rural America. We're still kind of in that watching and waiting pattern, but I know that we're seeing more and more cases sure. every day number of cases increasing. Let's start with how widespread COVID-19 is in rural America. Yeah, let's talk about that because uh, we were able to pull some maps together that start to show the audience a little bit about how it's spreading across the country and in our region of the country. You know, earlier today, we were able to pull this map uh, off the website and it showed there are approximately 143,000 again, confirmed cases across the United States, about 2,500 deaths, and of just over 4,800 individuals that are recovering. There are a couple of things that are important about this map. One is that these are just confirmed cases, and we think that that number is off by a very large factor. But as the audience looks quickly across this map, what you'll see is that most of the dark red areas are located across the coast. So, of course, we've been tracking what's been going on in New York City, New York State, New Jersey, and Connecticut, but then all the way down the eastern seaboard densely into Florida. And then when we go to the west coast of the country, you see Northern California, you see Southern California uh, as well. But when we look in the middle part of the country, and this is one of the points that I wanted to make with the audience tonight, is you see the areas such as Chicago, which are brightly uh, lit in red here, but you also see not only hundreds, maybe thousands of tiny little red dots that are spread across this part of the Midwest. And that's just an indication that there are reported cases in small communities, large communities. And when we talk to Marty in a few minutes, he'll talk about his experiences uh, with clinical care as well in a very rural community. And then finally, in this, this map of the state of Nebraska, which again was done earlier today, there were 120 uh, confirmed cases with two confirmed deaths. But I pointed out to show you that while there's a lot of density, a lot of bright yellow in this case, around Omaha and Lincoln, uh, Nebraska, but if you go across the state, you'll see there are many, many rural counties uh, that are now confirming uh, cases uh, of, uh, of COVID-19. So while we've been talking for the last several weeks with the uh, RFD-TV audience, about the potential spread across rural communities uh, of our nation. We're now actually seeing that number spread, uh, not just in the urban parts of the uh, mid-American states, but in the rural communities as well. Ooh. So it's something that our rural audience needs to keep an eye on. Absolutely. It's, it's so critical. I mean, Marty, you work at a rural hospital. You know how serious this is. More than half of the counties in the U.S. have no ICU beds. Ventilators can be hard to come by as well. What are your greatest concerns about COVID-19 in rural America, especially when you see all those dots kind of closing in on the center of the country? Well, uh, my biggest concern is, is uh, taking care of our staff, actually. Uh, we, of course, small rural hospitals uh, have limited uh, limits on everything. I mean, our resources are very limited. Uh, limited staff, we have limited uh, supplies. We have limited uh, uh, negative pressure rooms. We have no ventilators. Uh, when you start adding this thing, these things together, uh, it could be a recipe for disaster if we have a huge surge. And that is what we are doing our very best to prevent in our rural communities at this time. Uh, 
I mean, trying to prepare for a worst case scenario in a rural community, how do you get ahead of that? I mean, how can you make a preemptive strike to even position yourself in a better way? What do you do? Well, the first thing you do is, of course, connect yourself with other people, uh, people that know what they are doing and have been through some uh, infectious disease uh, events before. And uh, by in Nebraska, we have uh, what I think is the epicenter in caring for infectious disease at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. We have experts there who have treated Ebola, who have treated uh, some of the first uh, COVID cases in, in this country. And uh, we are very proud to call them friends, and they are more than willing to share their knowledge with all of us. Uh, they put it out online where anybody can reach it. And then we also, of course, uh, real hospital CEOs get together uh, online now, of course, not together, and uh, talk about uh, what's going on in our communities and what we can, how we can help each other prepare. Uh, you know, have you thought of this? And, and, and uh, essentially what we do is prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Wow. Okay. We're going to go straight to the phones. Our lines are already lighting up. Please keep those great questions coming. Nancy from Missouri, you're first up tonight. Go right ahead. Thank you for taking my call. I'm kind of curious why we didn't have the same reaction to H1N1 or SARS that we're having now and treat this sort of like a herd immunity. Should we not all be exposed and then we make it or we break it, we get through it, we get past it. I what happens when we all go back, or do we not see a bump and a jump again in infection? Yeah, so uh, there are a number of reasons, Nancy, that, uh, that this is different from H1N1 or SARS or, uh, or any of these other infections. First of all, it's a different virus, and that means it's got different characteristics of transmission. It's got different characteristics of the illness that it causes as well. So this particular virus uh, has a uh, way that it spreads uh, that means that an average individual who gets the infection will transmit it to somewhere between, uh, oh, roughly two and a half to almost three other individuals. That's almost twice the rate of influenza. This virus causes an infection that predominantly causes severe pneumonia, particularly in older and more vulnerable individuals. And that pneumonia tends to last, not days like the pneumonia caused by influenza, but frequently two weeks, sometimes three weeks, which means that a hospitalization that might be under a week for somebody with uh, a typical uh, influenza pneumonia uh, would have a much more sustained effect. These images that you're now looking at in the bright green and bright yellow show that there's disease that's present in both lungs and it's extremely dense, and that causes uh, significant uh, impact on the respiratory system that in prox approximately 1% of people requires intensive care unit stays and even place on mechanical ventilation. Again, uh, significantly more common uh, than influenza. So different patterns of spread, Nancy, uh, different patterns of disease, longer recovery, uh, make this a very, very different consideration. Okay, thank you for that call, Nancy. Really appreciate that. We're going to move on to a social media question. Earl from Montana is joining the conversation. He wants to know, we live in the mountains and seasonal residents are coming in from the city. Our small medical clinic can't take a large surge. What happens if we all get sick at one time? Well, Earl, let's hope you don't all get sick at one time uh, because that would be a really uh, bad situation. Uh, you know, the, all of the stuff that you've probably read and that we've spoken about on these uh, programs before uh, regarding social distancing, uh, hand washing, uh, cleaning surfaces with appropriate cleansing materials, uh, certainly if you're ill or a family member is ill, staying home. And most importantly, uh, that if somebody becomes ill, rather than uh, getting in the car and heading off to your nearest clinic or hospital, what you want to do is pick up the phone. You want to practice these everyday preventive measures, uh, cover coughs and sneezes, uh, use soap and water uh, and, or hand sanitizer, uh, at least with 60% alcohol, and do it for at least 20 seconds. And then clean frequently touched surfaces, you know, things like doorknobs, sink tops, even toilet seats we've now learned are important to be cleaned. Uh, you clean your cell phone as well, uh, and I mean the surface of it, that is. 
Uh, and, uh, and those simple things are what's going to keep us from infecting each other. And those simple things are what's going to keep the demand uh, in a, both our rural and our urban hospitals uh, to the absolute minimum. No matter where you live, that applies. No matter where you are in the country, you want to practice the safest measures to keep yourself and your family members safe and our communities. Our next question comes from the Hawkeye State. Let's listen. Hi, this is Amanda from Iowa. Um, can you guys tell me when you think the coronavirus will peak in rural areas? I hear it could be months. Yeah, Amanda, uh, you know, Nobody really knows when it's going to peak. Uh, there's a lot of data that's come from our friends and colleagues in China, in uh, Western Europe, uh, in the Middle East. And now we're starting to see a good deal of data from the west coast of the United States uh, and, of course, from the New York metropolitan area and Florida. What we learned that the peak depends an awful lot upon how effectively the non-pharmacologic interventions are implemented. We were just talking about those common sense things like hand washing and cleaning surfaces. And, uh, you know, Amanda, the more of that we do, the, the lower the peak is going to be, but the longer the cycle is going to be. And that's really what we're trying to accomplish. If we can get that peak down so low that it doesn't stress our rural and urban hospitals, that's really the goal that we have right now until there's an effective vaccine or a good antiviral drug that's available to as many individuals who need it. So, uh, you know, if we can get that, that peak uh, to occur out in the, uh, you know, later June or even into the summer uh, at a very, very low level, uh, we will not only prevent the use of our health care systems to an uh, overrode uh, level, but we'll save lives. Okay, great question. Our next caller is Steve from South Dakota. You're on live. Go right ahead, Steve. Um. I feel very good about living in a rural area. Uh, we're self-isolating and doing the things we're supposed to do here. My question is if we're able to push the peak down and stave off the, uh, I guess you'd call it infestation for, let's say, in June and July, are the supplies being replenished fast enough so that we can expect there to be the devices, the protection, the the, the medical supplies needed, or will they be completely exhausted at that time? Well, Steve, the current thinking is, as the supply chain continues to strengthen, that doing what you just described is going to be the magic medicine uh, for this until a vaccine or a good antiviral therapy uh, is developed. Uh, whether it's personal protective equipment, meaning masks, face shields, and gowns that are so critical to hospitals, uh, whether it's uh, access to uh, hand cleanser or other uh, critically important supplies, uh, indeed uh, ventilators and, and even hospital beds, uh, there is very, very little question that if we can flatten that curve as you're describing, and by the way, thank you and thank your family for doing all the things that you're doing, uh, we will really, really... Uh, do a big service, particularly to those that are most vulnerable, which would be the older generation, as well as uh, those that have heart disease, uh, respiratory diseases such as asthma or COPD, individuals who are being treated for cancer or on, have diabetes or, or other uh, immunosuppressive medications. So while you know the young may think that they're immune, of course that is not true, and there are a lot of reported cases now of young individuals ending up hospitalized and even in critical care units on ventilators, uh, there is no question that the biggest impact of this are as those that are most vulnerable. You know, I'd be interested in hearing from Marty about what supplies his hospital is most in need of if you are to, say, take on a surge. What, what do you need? Well, frankly, we need everything. Uh, we have a limited supply of everything right now, and uh, we really need to present, pre prevent that surge uh, so that we don't uh, end up in a, in a serious situation. Uh, one of the things I'd like to mention, uh, and I think it's important for all rural communities, is uh, almost all of the cases that have occurred in rural communities have come from people traveling out of state. When spring comes to Nebraska, there are two places everyone likes to go. One is the ski slopes in Colorado, and the other is Florida. 
and both were a bad idea this year because they brought home an unwelcome guest when they came back to our communities. So if we can just stop people from traveling and do exactly what Steve and his family are doing in South Dakota, and that's, that's stay home, uh, we can do a lot to really flatten this curve in rural communities and in the cities. Right. So even if you are isolated by the landscape, for example, it's still a good idea to stay inside, limit your your outdoor activity, I would say, when it comes to contacting other people. You just want to play it safe. But that's a really good point that you bring up about the vacationers. We have a special guest joining us on the phone tonight, American Soybean Association CEO Ryan Finley. Ryan, what questions do soybean producers have about COVID-19 right now? Okay, it sounds like we're having a little bit of difficulty getting Ryan on the phone. So we're going to continue our conversation. Our next question comes to us from Jolene in Texas. And Jolene wants to know, can you get coronavirus from prepared food? This is a big question that's been coming up recently. Both my mother and my husband's mother get meals on wheels delivered in rural Texas. And Jolene's concerned. What would you say to her? Yeah, Jolene. Uh, so, uh, you know, I would say the number of reported cases from that type of spread are extremely small, and that's not something that we commonly uh, encounter. Uh, as a matter of fact, unless somebody who we know is infected coughs or sneezes on the food as they're preparing it, uh, it is extremely unlikely that that's going to be a source uh, of food. Now, of course, is, is it always safer to prepare the food yourself? Yes, it is. But if you're one of those individuals who depends on prepared food in our country, and there are a lot of older adults as well as uh, a good deal of uh, young individuals, children, et cetera, who depend on prepared food, uh, that uh, we have to balance the risk. And certainly we need to maintain our nutrition and maintain a reasonably uh, healthy diet. Uh, the survivability of the virus on various surfaces that can be metal, plastic, cardboard, etc., is typically uh, in the area of hours uh, or maybe up to as much as a day. And so the heating that goes on with uh, typical uh, hot meals uh, as well as the preparation process usually does a pretty good job of uh, rendering that virus uh, unable to cause infection. Okay. We have another hotline caller, Clay in Georgia. He left a message. He wants to know about the potential lung damage from COVID-19 and how long that damage might last. Let's listen. Is that damage going to be permanent? I've got to get out in the field, plant and harvest later this year. There's a lot of dust out there. If I catch this thing, should I be worried about it affecting me the rest of my life? Yeah, Clay, I, I guess the, uh, the, the best answer is that the majority of the individuals who have recovered, uh, you know, first of all, it takes them the weeks to recover, uh, even if they have a mild infection until they're completely recovered. Uh, and they seem to recover pretty fully. Now, all of us have significant amount of lung reserve. You know, having practiced uh, chest surgery for many, many decades of my life, I can tell you that, you know, you, all of us can live uh, with one lung and not two. And certainly uh, you could lose a lobe of your lung uh, due to surgery for an infection or for a malignancy and lead a perfectly normal life and have pretty darn good uh, exercise tolerance. So I would say it's going to vary greatly. So, for instance, if this was an individual that had perfectly normal lung function and they had uh, 15 or 20 percent of their lung infected, even if that lung was rendered unusable for a period of time, uh, they'd probably never know the difference. But if this was an individual that had had previous lung surgery or had chronic obstructive lung disease, COPD or bad asthma, and they had an infection that involved both of their lungs, maybe even needed a ventilator uh, to support them, uh, they might have a longer term impact on their ability to take a deep breath and to have a normal exercise tolerance. And the prognosis, though, is still pretty darn good that they would recover back to their baseline function. You know, I think the best answer is uh, ask us in six months. We'll have a much better idea by then. 
You know, Dr. Gold, you are always so transparent with us. And I do know that you are getting new information every single day about the virus, information that you're discovering based on your research and what you're hearing from the medical community. So when we come back, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the latest news that's coming out. We have to pause for a quick break, but our phone lines are open, 877-731-6733. More Rural Health Matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor, Dr. Gold. Thank you so much for joining us. And Marty Fadig also joins us. Really, really grateful to have both of you with us from the Namaha County Hospital in Nebraska. We have a special guest joining us now on the phone, American Soybean Association CEO, Ryan Finley. Ryan, what questions do our soybean producers have about COVID-19? Well, good evening. I think that there's a lot of questions, a lot of uncertainty right now that's happening, and, and they're really across the spectrum. I think one of the questions that I get that is really mixed messages is how long does COVID-19 remain on surfaces? And so farmers are saying, look, I'm not worried about the dust on the planter being a carrier, but what should I be paying attention to around my farm of what could be a carrier of COVID from a surface standpoint? Yeah, Ryan, you know, our, our researchers here just published a paper uh, on Friday morning, just uh, late last week, that specifically addressed some of these questions. And this particular study, uh, we'll talk about farms and ranches in just a second, but this particular study uh, looked at common surfaces uh, in our uh, quarantine unit. So this is all negative pressure space where individuals uh, who uh, came back from the Diamond Princess cruise ship who were confirmed to have infections from uh, COVID-19 were being housed. Now, these were not hospitalized patients. These were patients with very minimal symptoms but had a confirmed infection. And what our research scientists found is that you could recover the RNA, the genetic material from these viruses on countertops, uh, desks, uh, cafeteria trays, you could recover it from sinks and toilet seats. Uh, you could recover it from doorknobs. And again, typically for uh, several hours uh, after uh, the individual touched those surfaces. We also found uh, that there are very small uh, particles uh, of not the virus itself, but the RNA from the virus, the genetic material, that can actually be recovered from the air in the rooms that the patients are being housed in and from the hallways around the quarantine units uh, in which these patients are, are being held. So from a farming and ranching perspective, you know, what we're really interested in is the common contact areas, you know, the steering wheels on uh, tractors and, and farm equipment, again, doorknobs and hasps and other such things that people touch all the time. And indeed, the single best advice is to wipe this down with a cleansing material as frequently as reasonable. Make sure you wash your hands uh, several times a day. And of course, uh, if you're sick, uh, you know, don't get out on that equipment. Uh, stay home, take care of yourself, uh, protect your family members and your coworkers. All right, I believe you have another question for us, Ryan. Go right ahead. No, that's, that's really difficult sometimes to tell a farmer, especially this time of the year, coming into the, the spring season where we wanna be planting, we wanna be out there. And what you just said makes sense. Yeah, I can wash my hands and it's not a problem to rest when I need to. But if I'm not feeling the best and I still need to get out there, I need to plant. What do you tell the farmer or the, the family farms that are out there when you have to have the conversation with dad or grandpa to say, you can't be in the shop today or we don't want you in the field with us right now because we're worried about your health? How do you I know that's a tricky, a tricky question, but. How, if you're a farmer, how do you answer that one? Well, my instinct, and we'll ask the expert here in a minute, but my instinct is to say, taking a couple of days or a week or even 14 days uh, at home, if you are confirmed to have an infection uh, with COVID-19, probably beats the heck out of having your dad or granddad in an intensive care unit on a ventilator. You know, we have a social uh, moral obligation to protect the most vulnerable in our communities. 
And while the majority of the young people uh, who farm, and there are a good number of people who are older and do have some of these other conditions, uh, but the majority of the young people, if they get this disease, are going to be minimally ill. They're going to think they have the flu or a cold. And some of them, as much as maybe one out of five, under the age of 50, won't even know that they have it. And yet they can give it to their parents, to their, you know, co-workers and their grandparents, and, uh, and they will know that they have it because they will become highly symptomatic, they will need medical care, and heaven forbid they might even need hospitalization. So Marty, what would you tell the uh, 65, 70-year-old farmer or rancher who says, you know, this is calving season or planting season, and darn it, I'm going to go out there and do it anyway? Well, this sounds like my family, and uh, they would say exactly those things. Uh, I would tell them uh, from, uh, first of all, I'd ask them where they went to medical school, and then I would... Then I would... They'd probably tell you, right? <laughs> yeah, they would say, none of your business. But anyway, uh, the thing that I would tell them is, how, would you rather take a few days off this year so you can be around next year for that season? Uh, because this is important. It, it's, it's not something to laugh at, not something to take lightly. We need to take this very, very seriously. And, you know, Grandpa doesn't need to go to the, into town and drink coffee with the boys in the morning before he jumps on the planter as well. Uh, that is where, you know, he can probably pick up this disease. So it's best that you just drink Grandma's coffee and go out and get on the tractor and, and do everything that Dr. Gold has said to do about cleaning things up and, and, and just minding your health. So I'm going to bet that Grandma's coffee is pretty good, and I couldn't agree with you more. Staying out of town is, uh, is really very, very important. And you know, a lot of our farmers and ranchers don't just work on their farm and ranch, but they are, you know, the volunteer ambulance corps. I'm sure many of them volunteer in your hospital from time to time. And, uh, you know, they really need to focus on those activities that are critically important to the community. They certainly do. Uh, I'll just give you an example. We had a, a member of our uh, executive, our, our uh, board of trustees at our hospital who has had a, uh, a uh, kidney transplant. And uh, he, was, he called me the day before the board meeting and he says, Marty, what do you think I ought to do? And I said, I think you ought to stay home. Yeah, uh, call in, right? Yeah, right. And, and, and now we ha we're able to do that. Our governor has allowed, has dropped the requirements down so we don't have to have in-person meetings. We can, we can meet via electronic means and get that work done and still uh, keep everybody safe. All good advice. Okay, our next question is on the same vein, but he takes it a step further. Randy from Kansas is next. He says, no one from my family of eight has the virus. We range from six to 83 years old and our dinners are important to us on our ranch. Is it safe to keep eating together? So, Randy, you know, that's a hard question because the uh, young folks down at the age of six and those that are at the other end of the spectrum uh, in their early 80s are so used to it that it really is the social connectivity. It's the thread that really holds many elements of the family together. However, uh, you know, if all of these individuals, all eight, uh, never go into town, are always healthy currently, and don't run the risk of being exposed to somebody, and you've been dining together, uh, you can probably continue to do that, certainly up until at least the time that somebody were to start to develop even the earliest possible symptoms. But having said that, Randy, I think that it's inevitable that probably not the six-year-old is going to go into town, but somebody else, uh, probably uh, one of the teenagers or others, uh, to stock up on supplies or equipment or maybe has a volunteer job that they need to do or other occupation in town, in the post office or, uh, or in one of the hospitals. And they're going to be exposed to other people. And so I would say for at least the older generation or the oldest part of your eight-member family, uh, particularly uh, if they have any of the other vulnerable risk factors like heart disease or lung disease or had a kidney transplant like uh, Marty's board member did, I would say they probably ought to be separated for dinner, and they probably shouldn't sit on the sofa together and, uh, you know, watch movies at night or on the weekend and share a bowl of popcorn or, or other things. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> this is not going to go on forever. Can't be absolutely sure how long it's going to last. But the social responsibility is uh, to try to protect those most vulnerable, and hopefully uh, that's what the family can do. 
It's so hard to hear that. You know, so many grandparents across the country are in isolation right now. They're just wondering when life as we know it will resume. Can you give us some guidance on, on how we can maybe lift their spirits right now or maybe just talk to them directly and let them know that this will one day come to an end? But I think people just need a little encouragement right now, Dr. Gold. You know, absolutely. And I tell you, as you probably remember, Christine, I'm a grandparent. <laughs> I've got uh, twin grandchildren, a little boy and a little girl, and they're about three and a half years old. And gosh, I miss them. I mean, they're at this most incredible cuddly age, and uh, it's grandpa this and grandpa that. And, uh, but I uh, communicate with them, uh, you know, electronically with FaceTime. Uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> I'll be with them uh, as I was last weekend when they were cooking, doing puzzles. Uh, we were playing together uh, <clears throat> through FaceTime. I read to them through FaceTime, and, and, you know, they talk to me about things that are really important to them. Uh, this weekend, uh, we were doing a, a big jigsaw puzzle together, and they were counting all the different colors and the, the butterflies and the crickets that were uh, out there. So we need to find these means. I mean, there are all kinds of stories of people coming up to windows of senior living facilities, uh, using the phone and other commu uh, computer media, sending cards and, and other materials uh, back and forth to people in order to share all the love and all the warm feelings uh, that we have for each other. And believe me, I know it's not easy, but it's not going to go on forever. And what we need to do is get through it with the fewest number of hospitalizations. You know, the last thing that I'd ever want to do is feel that I spread the infection to my children or grandchildren, and I'm sure they would feel pretty uncomfortable uh, if, you know, any of their grandparents got ill uh, as a result of, uh, of, uh, of their visits to us. And so we're just going to hunker down and, uh, and do the best we can and, and know that we're going to get through this in a couple months, and we'll be back hugging before you know it. I love how you gave us at least a couple months. I mean, I feel like, like we can get there. We can do a couple months, but some people are hearing different different trajectories, like this is going to take a year, maybe two years. So it, it's really hard with all the uncertainty right now and then all of us at home just soaking up every bit of information we can possibly get about the virus. That can create anxiety. Talk about how we can all kind of work on our mental health right now and really just kind mm. of keep things nice and center. How, how do we do that? How do we keep a level head here? Well, there's, there's no question that this social isolation has both medical and emotional behavioral health uh, related concerns that are associated with it. So, uh, you know, there are many things that can be done. We just talked about using electronic media, phones, <clears throat> FaceTime, computers uh, to communicate with people. But one of the best pieces of advice that I've had, and it's actually been pretty helpful for me as well, is to write out a schedule. Not that you have to adhere to it rigidly, but, you know, make sure that your meals are on the schedule so you get a reasonable amount of nutrition. If you do need to go into town to do some shopping, schedule it out. Uh, try to do it so that only one person goes into town instead of two or three. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, if you need to uh, uh, schedule it, you know, just get some exercise every day. I know most of our farmers and ranchers get plenty of exercise just in doing their farming and their ranching responsibilities. Make sure you get plenty of sleep. You know, schedule some time that you're going to be on the phone with your loved ones, your children, your grandchildren. And I have found that that to be a pretty helpful thing. And a number of the psychiatrists that I've uh, come to know quite well tell me that that's a useful thing as well. But then finally, Christina, I would add one other very important consideration. And that is that if you're really down, if you're losing your appetite, if you're not getting sleep, if there are other signs of, you know, more than just the usual ups and downs, but, you know, what we would call depression or pre-depression type of anxiety syndrome, you really want to pick up the phone and talk to somebody with get some professional help. Because there's no question that this type of social isolation, particularly if you live alone, you know, if you're with one or two or four other people that you live with, at least you have folks to talk to, to, uh, you know, watch television with, surf the web, uh, talk about all the news events of the day. But if you don't have that, you know, I think you're at somewhat more risk. And that's the time that you'd probably want to pick up the phone. If you need to, call your local public health office. Uh, certainly, there are a number of behavioral health hotlines that you can call. 
And uh, don't hesitate to do that. You know, the number of those calls is going up by an order of magnitude, and it's really important to be able to use them. I'd ask you, Marty, you know, have you had that conversation in, uh, in Nimaha? We have, and, and it is very difficult there because, of course, rural communities are generally older than, than urban communities. So it is of grave concern to us. Uh, social isolation is always a problem, and so we need to be sure and keep track of, of our older citizens and, and those that have uh, vulnerabilities, those that have uh, uh, compromised health to begin with. Mm -hmm. We really need to look after those folks. You know, there's things you can do in a rural, in a rural setting that to help uh, relieve the stress or take away some of the anger and anxiety. Uh, one of the best ones for me is to grab a curry comb and go stroke a horse for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, the horse likes it, and I like it, and I feel better when I'm finished. So, and the horse looks better. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Very important animals. Usually, right? <laughs> you, know, you bring up animals, and this is something that we've talked about on, on past shows, but for the viewers who might be joining us for the first time, it's okay to hug our pets, right? Our dogs and our cats, our family members, our horses, we're okay to go out there and, and hug our animals, right, as long as we're not showing symptoms? That's right. You know, the last thing in the world you want to do is cough or sneeze on your pet or certainly a family member. Uh, and then uh, have somebody else uh, hug that same pet and uh, get droplets of infection on them. But if you're well, you know, your, your pets, you know, we talk a lot about what's called pet therapy. And many hospitals such as ours actually have an active pet therapy program <clears throat> where people bring pets in uh, to their hospital under very specific circumstances. And particularly children, we found, uh, do very well with it. <clears throat> a lot of our older geriatric patients happen to like it as well. So, you know, our feeling is as long as they're really healthy and the pet is healthy and the individual is healthy. Now, obviously, we're not going to do pet therapy for people that are hospitalized for a COVID uh, disease because <clears throat> that's just a way of spreading it to every room down the hallway. Uh, and we're certainly not going to do that. But I think at home... Uh, you know, we need to rely on those kinds of social things uh, that give us comfort, and that's one of them. Ah. It's like carrying your horse, right, Marty? That's right. <laughs> How about all the people who are isolated? And, I mean, this is, I found myself when I took a week because I had some symptoms. I was just eating the whole time just to stay busy, just stuffing food in my mouth. Do you think that there's going to be a problem with people gaining a lot of weight during this time frame after we go and look back? And how do we mitigate that, that desire to want to eat all the food in our cupboard to kind of feel better right now. You know, uh, Christina, they're actually calling this the COVID-14, and not for the 14 days, but for the 14 pounds that might uh, go with it. And so your question is right on. Uh, so again, I, I think the best thing to do is to, first of all, schedule your meals and, and don't graze between meals if you can possibly avoid it. Obviously, fresh fruit and vegetables, if you can get them, particularly in the farming and ranching communities, uh, are always a good snack if you're uh, looking for it. And then, uh, you know, trying to get out. You know, family walks are, are good things if you're in the city. Uh, if you're in a, a rural community, you know, get out yourself. Get out with your family. There's no reason you can't go bicycling or uh, jogging or certainly go for a good long walk with your immediate family, as long as you're not exposing yourself to other individuals uh, who are ill <clears throat> or you're uncertain of their symptomatic status. Okay, great. We're really happy to hear that. And God bless all the farmers and ranchers who are working through this, helping us to keep our cupboard stocked. We're going to pause for a quick break, but our phone lines are open and we want to hear from you. 877-731-6733. More Rural Health Matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again tonight, University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold and Chief Executive of Nemaha County Hospital in Nebraska. Marty Fadig joins us as well. Leonard from Wyoming has a question on social media. He wonders, our town's hospital has about 25 beds and it could be overwhelmed in no time. Is there a way to help the staff get ready? That's a great question, Leonard. I'm just going to turn that right over to my colleague here who could probably uh, tell you exactly what they're doing in their hospital to help the staff get ready. Well, I, I think it's 
one of the first things I think it is very, very important to be perfectly honest with your staff. They are reading things on Facebook. They are reading things on all sorts of social media. And a lot of it is, is just simply not true. So we need to, you need to find a good source for your information. And the best way to provide that information to your staff is, is to prepare it yourself. Uh, I, I prepare a daily uh, update for my staff so they know uh, what's going on, what's real and what's not real, what things have changed in our organization. Oh, we want to make sure that we have enough uh, equipment for everybody. Uh, let them know uh, what's going on in our community about, uh, as far as uh, cases, uh, testing, and that sort of thing. Uh, update on how our medical staff is working. Uh, it, it all, all of it is basically communication. And the best thing to do is, is Dr. Gold's equivalent of a schedule, and that is a plan. You need to have a plan in place so that your staff feels you are prepared. Now, as soon as you get into this crisis, the plan goes away and everything changes, but at least you had a plan to start with, and folks know, or at least get the, get the feeling, uh, that you know what you're doing and that you care. You know, you talk about that plan. Should residents also have a plan? Should they have a plan for, okay, if, if I do have symptoms and I need medical treatment, I am going to go to my small hospital. But if that hospital is already at capacity, do I then need to have another plan in place to maybe go to a big city hospital? Is that something that we should be thinking about as well? Absolutely. But, you know, a couple of points about that, Christina. One is, as Marty said, trusted sources of information. Don't make your judgments uh, off of things, off random Internet sites, uh, off of random pieces of social media. Use the trusted sites. Use your county health department. Use uh, information from your state health department or from the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC. But have a plan and have contingencies. You know, if your plan is your next door neighbor uh, is going to take you to your health care professional if you get sick or if you have confirmed disease and you might need to be seen, uh, you know, think about what happens if your next door neighbor is out on their farm or ranch and you can't reach them. Uh, think about who the next call is going to be. Uh, if for some reason, uh, you know, your local hospital uh, has had a number of staff members call in because they're either in quarantine or in isolation or sick, you know, where's the next place that you can go? Uh, if you needed some very specialized care, uh, you know, you probably need a bunch of phone numbers. And I think, Christina, that's particularly important for some of the older people uh, in our communities uh, because they may not be quite so facile with social media, they may not be quite so facile uh, with the directory assistance and things of that nature. Uh, and so uh, they ought to have a number of phone numbers written down uh, or put them in their, you know, directory of their, uh, of their phone so that they know uh, who to reach, how to reach them quickly, uh, and, and how to reach them, uh, you know, particularly uh, if there's an, uh, an emergency. Hopefully it won't be necessary, but, you know, as uh, Marty said, uh, we want to hope for the best and uh, plan for the worst. Okay. Well, I think one thing I would add, one thing I would add is that, that it is imperative that small rural communities prepare their community as well. They need to give their community accurate information, and they need to give them a plan of what to do, you know, to, to advise them to call before they come to the hospital and not just drive up to the emergency room. Uh, things along those lines. Uh, what they can do at home and what they should do what, and when they should uh, come to the hospital for, for a higher level of care. So, Marty, you had one instance so far in Nemaha County, right? We did. And maybe a very brief explanation of that would be of interest to our audience, because this was a really well-managed case, right? If you, we had to have a positive case, we had the perfect patient. And I hope the next one is equally perfect, by the I way. hope so as well. Uh, this person uh, got the social disease. They went to uh, Colorado skiing. And they, came, they became ill while they were in Colorado. They drove back to Auburn. But instead of going downtown or going to the clinic or, 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 or going to the grocery store, uh, they self-quarantined at home. And this gentleman, his wife did not go with him on the trip, but she self-quarantined at home as well. And then when they did require testing, we, tested the, we uh, acquired the specimen for testing in our ambulance garage, in the pa and the patient was still sitting in his car, and the collector 
of the specimen had all the protective equipment on so the the hospital was never contaminated with the COVID-19 virus. Uh, the patient had a mild case of the disease, got better, and the wife has not been positive, and that's been over uh, three weeks ago now. So. Wow, what a great story, and what a great example. And a perfect example of, hey, rural communities are not going to be spared. So I really, really appreciate having you on tonight, Marty. Just great, always Dr. Gold, we love having you on. We have another caller who left us a message for the both of you, let's take a listen. And this is uh, David from Arkansas. Uh, like everybody, you know, I'm worried about getting COVID-19 on my trips into town. I've got enough supplies to last for a while, but not forever. I've got to go into town. Realistically, how long do you think this will last? How long do I have to get by on what I've got now? You know, David, uh, I don't think that there's a single answer to that. It's going to vary a lot from state to state and from community to community. Part of it has to do with, uh, in your rural community in Arkansas, uh, how many cases you have and, uh, and, you know, therefore what the level of contamination is. Certainly you want to go into town as uh, infrequently as possible. You want to run all your errands at once if you can possibly do it. And maybe what you might want to do is, if you have other family members, is alternate and take turns uh, from, uh, from who gets to make that drive into town. And while you might normally stop and socialize a little bit with some folks, I'd recommend that you not do that. You know, at least for the next several weeks, could you get a feeling for what the rate of rise is in your community? So if you have no cases, and in a month from now you have no cases, you know, uh, I think you're going to feel a little bit more comfortable more willing to go into town and do some of the things you normally do. But for now, until we really see what's going to happen as the red dots continue to spread rapidly across the rural communities of the United States, this is the time we really need to have maximal care. You know, as I look at our rural communities across the country, uh, even those that have one or two cases, just like the one Marty just described, we don't know whether that's the tip of the hockey stick, you know, rapidly rising up, uh, or whether it's going to just stay at that one or two cases, and that's going to be the last that in Marty's situation, Nemaha County, uh, ever sees. I certainly hope it's the latter, but, you know, truth is we just don't know. And until we know that, we all need to take care of ourselves, and in so doing, we need to take care of others. Absolutely. Okay, Arlene from Ohio, thank you for your patience. Go right ahead. This is Arlene Grunhagen calling, and I'd like to know what we can, how we can find out if we are immune to it and when we can go and help other people. Great question, Arlene. And a lot of people are asking that across the United States right now. And that has to do with the question of when and how we become immune uh, to the disease. Uh, that is what's called active immunity. When you or I get the measles or mumps or chicken pox or, or other such diseases, uh, we develop immunity to it. Uh, that's what vaccines do. They make you immune. And there's good data that people that get COVID-19 and recover from it do develop antibodies and do become immune. Unfortunately, we don't know a couple of things. First of all, does everybody develop antibodies or just some? Uh, how long do those antibodies last? Do they last a month? Do they last six months? Do they last a lifetime? And then how effective they are? And uh, we don't know the answer to those questions. There are several large universities across the country and around the world that are trying to answer exactly those questions, Arlene, because that would be the best way to have advice for you. I will also tell you there are some studies, there are some laboratory tests that are being developed right now called serologic testing which actually will allow the research labs and then the clinical labs to measure the amount of antibodies uh, that you may have. And so if you've got high titers, high quantities of these antibodies, then you're going to be immune for a good long time. If you've got very low or minimal quantities or no quantities of these antibodies, even if you've been affected, then, uh, then you're probably not going to be immune. And so until we have a better experience with people who have recovered, and more of these antibody tests, my best advice to you is don't expose yourself again, even if you know you've been infected. 
Good advice. You know, I've got to ask you as a meteorologist, people are talking about the potential seasonality of COVID-19. I know that you're at the forefront of all the research. Are you hearing anything more about that? Yeah, we are. Uh, certainly, the, uh, there are two aspects of the uh, so-called thermolability of the virus, the variability that happens uh, in the warmer weather. One thing that happens is people don't congregate in their homes as much. So as a result of that, they're out in their fields, uh, they're out in the park, they're walking and running, and uh, they were playing sports, I guess, but not anymore. Uh, and, uh, and so they're less likely to communicate uh, among friends uh, and family members. Uh, certain viruses, like influenza, do go away to some extent uh, as a seasonal uh, basis. However, based upon what we're seeing in the southern hemispheres, which of course have, we've gone through our winter, but they've gone through their summer, it does appear that this virus is spread pretty rapidly in the warmer climates. Now, clearly, we don't know what's going to happen in the U.S. and in the southern uh, part of our country uh, or the uh, far west. Uh, but if you look at Australia, New Zealand, certain parts of South America, although the reported numbers are low, the virus does seem to continue to spread in the warm weather. So my guess is it'll make it somewhat better, but it'll probably not take the problem away. Okay. All right, boy, we sure covered the whole gamut tonight. Thank you. Really appreciate you both taking all of those questions. I want to give you an opportunity for final thoughts. Well, thanks, Christina. Uh, you know, my final thoughts are, are pretty much the same as we always talk about. And uh, trusted sources of information, uh, your own health care provider, uh, trusted websites and other materials, taking care of yourself and taking care of others. And certainly, uh, if you're ill or you think you're becoming ill, the first thing to do is not get in the car and go sit in a waiting room with a whole bunch of other people who are infected. But what you want to do is pick up the phone, get online, and get the right instructions. Okay, Marty, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I agree with everything Dr. Gold said. Uh, and uh, I'd just like to add a couple of things. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, small rural hospitals uh, have been in trouble for, for a number of years. And this is not going to help. So uh, be kind to your small rural hospital and help them any way you can. Uh, we need to survive. We need health care in these rural communities. So, so help us out all you can. And I just can't emphasize enough how important it is to stay home, wash your hands. I tell my people, uh, be well and be safe. Uh, and God bless. We'll get through this thing. You know, Christina, one other thing. Uh, this is a time overall for kindness and grace. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And patience, patience, especially with the medical people who are putting themselves out there to help us right now. I think it's really been an opportunity for us to all appreciate each other as humans more going through this together. Thank you both so much for Absolutely. joining us tonight. UNMC Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold and Chief Executive of Namaha County Hospital in Nebraska, Marty Fadig. We really appreciate the both of you. If you'd like more information about our panelists, we were talking about the importance of those trusted sources. RFDTV.com is going to have some great options for you to stay informed on the crisis. You can also head to NebraskaMed.com and you can keep up to date as well with all their research. A lot of this research, the newest, the latest and the greatest is coming from the University of Nebraska Medical Center. We want to thank you for joining us. We're going to do this again on Thursday night at 9 p.m. Central Time. So we'd love to see you back then. Remember, you can call. Think about your questions now and call in live for Rural Health Matters. That's going to be 10 p.m. Eastern Time, 7 p.m. Pacific Time on Thursday. I want to thank you so much for joining us. Wishing you, your family, your community a beautifully blessed night. Good night from Rural America's Most Important Network.